So we have two presentations tonight, which I'm very excited about. I'm Annie, by the way, the program chair. And the first one is a presentation by one of our um, special scholarship recipients. So, you know, um, Ma and led by our scientific advisor, Megan Romberg, we award graduate students. And you heard from one of the graduate students a little earlier in the year um, when she came on and was asking us to fill out a survey and we'll hear from her later. And today we have uh, Prasanth Prakash Prabhu, who's a fourth year PhD student at Clark University. And we're very excited to have him. I think um, I really love the title of his talk. Uh, the Current Understanding of Nematode Trapping Mushrooms, Exploring the Sessile Sirens of the Fungal Kingdom. So I just, you know, I, I'm kind of a poetry nut and I found this title to be very poetic and very interesting. Um, so I'm very excited to hear his talk and just to tell you a little bit more about him before, um, before joining the uh, Department of Biology at Clark University, he did his bachelor's and master's in botany and studied different aspects of plant biology. His current project is focused on the evolution of nematophagy, I hope I'm saying that correctly, but eating worms, um, in Pleurotaceae. And for the project, he's combining a wide range of techniques, including cultural studies, metabolomics, uh, comparative genomics, and transcriptomics to get a holistic view of the evolution of nematophagy in the Pleurotaceae, oyster mushrooms, and allies. And in addition to the research that he's doing, he also serves as a mentor um, in a program, 2023 spores program that works to create an inclusive environment to train next generation mycologists. So we're very thrilled to have him here. Um, thank you so much. And, you know, just a plug to anyone who's doing their own work out there that, you know, we have, you know, we, your, your membership dues is pay for these terrific scholarships and um, you get to come talk to us and, you know, definitely something to look out for in the next year. So welcome, Prasanth. We're very happy to have you. Uh, thank you, Annie, for a warm welcome. So uh, just let me start my presentation. Okay, so today I will be talking about the society sirens of the kingdom fungi and also exploring what can I explore from my own research findings. So as you all know, sirens are Greek mythological creatures that attract sailors towards them, causing their ship to wreck. But today we are going to discuss about sirens of the king, uh, kingdom fungi, and instead of sailors, they will attract microscopic invertebrates and they trap and they consume them. When we look at the sirens in the kingdom fungi or the predatory fungi, they are independently evolved in various fungal lineages. This is a phylogenomic tree of kingdom fungi. You can see that various fungal phyla are color coded and the red color lineages represent the predatory fungi that have evolved within this lineage. And depending upon the species, the prey can ranges from either rotifers, amoebae, even nematode trapping fungi. For my talk, I will be mostly focusing on nematode trapping fungi. When we look at the nematode trapping fungi, they produce a diverse trapping structure. It can range from the simple adhesive uh, branches to the adhesive network, as well as three-dimensional constructive rings that we all are known about. And all these trapping structures are produced by the members of ascomycetes that are more closely related to the moral mushroom. But we also have other members that are related to oyster mushrooms and the puffballs that also have developed the same capacity to trap and consume nematodes. And some of the trapping structures are similar to that of medieval weapons. For example, in the case of Trophyria rugosa annulata, it produces the acanthocyte that is similar to the medieval weapon, the ball and chain. Whereas in the case of Coprinus comatus, it produces spiky balls that is similar to a medieval weapon called calitro. In the case of Pinioforella, it produces stephanocytes that is similar to a medieval weapon that is called as uh, calitro. So we can have a diverse array of trapping structures within the mushroom forming fungi. And these are the different species of the mushrooms that are reported to have uh, nematode trapping capacity. 
In the top left, we have different species of bohemian buchelia that is able to trap and consume nematode. Then we also have different oyster uh, species that is also uh, have developed the capacity to trap and consume nematode. Then we have the shaggy mane or Coprinus comatus as well as Tropharia rugosanulata, which we saw a few minutes ago regarding the virtual ID table. And when we map these mushrooms onto a phylogenetic tree, we can see that within agaricalis or the major mushroom forming fungi, the nematophagy is evolved multiple times. That is based on the literature that is available there. So this is a phylogenetic tree of agaricalis and all the red color lineages represent the mushrooms that are reported to uh, have the, uh, the mushrooms that are uh, able to trap and consume nematodes. So I kind of revisited this concept and I collected all these different mushrooms, cultured them in water sugar, added the nematodes and see what is happening with them. Are they able to actually trap and consume nematodes or is it due to some cultural artifact? And as reported in the literature, all these fungi were able to produce the trapping structure. In the case of Stropheria rugosanulata, it produces the, produces the acanthocyte, whereas in the case of Coprinus comatus, it produces the spiny ball. And both of these structures cause a physical damage for the nematode and ultimately killing it and consuming it. Then we have the members of Pleurotaceae, that is the oyster mushrooms and the related species that produces different trapping structures. I will be discussing about the uh, trapping structures in Pleurotaceae within a little bit. So these are the different trapping structures that are produced by the members of Agaricale. And we expect that if they produce the trap, they should trap and consume nematodes. But when we look at the number of trapped nematodes, that was not the case. Here on the x-axis, we have the different species. And on the y-axis, we have the average number of trapped nematodes. And when we look at that, we can see that Hohenbuchelia mastrogata was able to trap and consume nematodes. And it uses two different strategies that I will discuss in a few minutes. And the same was the case in Pleurotus, where it was able to trap and consume nematodes. But interestingly, even though Coprinus comatus and Tropharia rugosanulata produces the trapping structures, it was not able to trap or consume the nematodes. So based on this finding, we can conclude that nematophagy is only limited to pleurotaceae that includes pleurotus and protein puchelia. And my rest of the talk will be focused on that. So when we look at pleurotaceae, pleurotaceae includes the white road genera, pleurotus and protein puchelia. Both of them are wood decaying saprotrophs thriving in a low nitrogen environment. And it is hypothesized that they capture the nematodes in order to supplement additional nitrogen. And to capture nematodes, they have developed unique nematode trapping strategies. When we look at the trap diversity, we can have different trapping structures within Pleurotaceae. In the case of Pleurotus, it produces a toxin droplet, and when the nematode comes in contact with it, it is paralyzed within seconds, and the paralyzed nematode is consumed by the fungi to get nitrogen. Whereas in the case of Pohin buchelia, we have further diversification of trapping strategies. We have some of the species that are called as predators that produce a decisive node. It's like a node that has a highly resistant glue on it. And when the nematode comes in contact with it, it is immobilized within seconds. And the immobilized nematode is consumed by the fungi to get nitrogen. Then we have some other species that are called as parasitoids. In the case of parasitoid species, it produces an adhesive conidia. So a conidia is similar to a spore with an adhesive on it. And when the nematode comes in contact with the adhesive conidia, it detaches from rest of the hyphae, moves along with the nematode, and eventually kills and consumes the nematode. Then we have the third group that are called as intermediate group that produces both adhesive nodes as well as the adhesive conidia. And when the nematode is captured, it is consumed by the fungi to get nutrients. So here you can see a paralyzed nematode that is colonized by Pleurotus pulmonarius. 
Here you can see a nematode that is immobilized by cocaine bufilia species. And here you can see a nematode that is colonized by a germinating conidia of cocaine bufilia fast So here we have a diverse array of trapping strategies. And so far, most of the studies have been based on the archomyces that we discussed earlier, which includes the cup fungi and the other genera. And based on that, they are hypothesizing that there is always a switch in which the fungi exist in a saprotrophic phase. And when there is either a nutrient limitation or a nematode, then it will transition to a predatory phase where it will produce the trap. And that makes sense because the formation of the trap requires involvement of various metabolic processes. So it will only produce the trap when it is necessary. But we don't know anything about the trapping mechanism or its behavior or what is happening in Fluorotaceae. So in order to answer this question, I am using a combination of approaches. I am combining the cultural studies to understand the effect of different nitrogen sources on nematode trapping behavior, and also using metabolomics to identify different metabolites that are produced during prey-predator interaction, as well as comparative genomics to understand evolution of genes that are involved in nematophagy across agaricalis, and transcriptomics to look at the gene expression pattern during the nematophagy. So based on our understanding in ascomycetes, we will expect that in the case of members of Pleurotaceae also, there is a saprotrophic phase where the fungi is not able to produce the trap, and there is a predatory phase where the fungi is able to produce the trap and consume the nematode. So we expect that to happen in the Pleurotaceae. But during my cultural studies, I found that the fungi are able to produce the trap constitutively regardless of the nutrient media. So as you can see here, this is a trap produced by Pleurotus pulmonarius on malt yeast extract agar, which is a high nutrient media. Similarly, it also produces the traps on potato dextrose agar. The same was the case in Pleurotus cisinopiator, where it produces the traps on highly nutrient media. And the same was also uh, also case in Cohen bufilia where it produces the trap regardless of the nutrient media where it is growing. So then we have this question where like if nematophagy is evolved as a mechanism to supplement nitrogen, then why is it producing the trap? So does the trap serve for other functions? To answer that question, I am using Cohen bufilia mastocata as a system to understand the evolution of nematophagy in Pleurotaceae. So as you can see, this is Hohen Buhlia mastocata. I fruited this mushroom in the lab, and it's a small Pleurotoid agaric, and it is an intermediate predator where it produces an adhesive node as well as an adhesive conidia. Here you can see a nematode that is attached to an adhesive node of a Hohen Buhlia mastocata. You can see the head of the nematode is attached to the adhesive node. Here, there is a nematode that has an adhesive conidia attached to a, its head, and the conidia will eventually germinate and will consume the nematode, again producing more conidia and repeating the cycle. So here we have like two different strategies to capture and consume nematode. So the logic behind the experiment was, if the traps are produced constitutively, then we expect that the nematode should be also trapped constitutively. But if that is the case, then the nematophagy serves for other function, maybe as a defensive mechanism, or since coin bufilia mastracata produces the adhesive conidia, it can be for dispersal. But there could be alternative scenario also, in which they can produce the traps, but they can only use them under nitrogen starvation. Then we can conclude that the nematophagy is evolved as a mechanism to supplement nitrogen without any other function. So in order to test this, the fungi was cultured in 
different nutrient media. Here we have malt yeast extract agar, potato dextrose agar, modified melin orkins media, modified melin orkins media without malt, corn meal agar, and wax agar. As you can see, depending upon the nutrient media, the colony morphology varies very quickly. And the numbers in brackets represent the amount of organic nitrogen that is present in each of the media. And we added the nematodes into each of the media and see what is happening to them. And as predicted, the fungi is able to produce the trap regardless of the nutrient composition. But when we looked at the number of trapped nematodes, there was something interesting happening here. You can see in the case of x-axis, you have the six different nutrient media. And on the y-axis, you have the average number of trapped nematodes. The fungi only trap the nematodes only in two media, that is the wart agar and the cornmeal agar. And in these two media, the amount of organic nitrogen was very less. Whereas in the case of other media, such as malt yeast extract agar or potato dextrose agar, even though they are producing the trap, they are not trapping the nematode because it has more amount of nitrogen. And you might be also wondering that why these two other media where even though it is having lesser organic nitrogen, fungi is not trapping the nematode in it. One of the possible reason is that when we make the media, we are adding two additional source of nitrogen in this media that are inorganic sources. So I am hypothesizing that maybe the presence of inorganic sources in these two media might inhibit the nematophagy in Putin Buchelia Masa So now we know that even though the fungi are able to produce the trap, they will only trap the nematode under starvation. And one of the future direction that I want to see is that if the fungi have any preference towards the particular nitrogen source, that is, the, does the fungi prefer a nematode or uh, organic source, or uh, does the fungi prefer an inorganic source or a nematode? And seeing what is happening, and based on that, I will be I will be able to develop a bioassay to do a nematode-free system for doing transcriptome. So this is an outline of my cultural studies. So far, I am able to convince you that the fungi are able to produce a trap, uh, but they are only able to trap the nematode under starvation. Now we are switching gears. Now we are going to look into the metabolites that are produced during prey predator interactions using pleurota citrinopileatus as a system. As you all know, Pleurotex produces a neurotoxin that causes the paralysis within seconds. Here I am going to show you a video how it is happening in real time. Here you have a nematode that is, and it is touching, and the paralyzed nematode will be eventually consumed by the fungi to get the nitrogen. And this is happening like within microseconds. So far, it was thought to be a trans, uh, it was thought to be a fatty acid that is trans to different dioic acid was considered as the compound that causes the paralysis in nematode. But until recently, researchers found that they developed a mechanism and they explained the mechanism in which the paralysis occurs. They found that when the nematode comes in contact with the toxin droplet, it causes massive release of calcium ions in the neuron, ultimately releasing, ultimately resulting in the cell death and the paralysis. So they were able to prove that the trans 2 disindioic acid is not the compound that causes the paralysis. I will explain you in a little bit. So this is the nervous system of a nematode, a healthy nematode, and the green colored uh, are the neurons of the nematode. And this is a nematode that is in response to trans to disindioic acid. Here we have some structural differences. 
when we look at a nematode that is exposed to the toxin that is produced by oyster mushroom, we can see that there is a drastic difference in how does the neurons behave in response to the nervous system. So based on this, they were able to conclude that trans dioic acid is not the compound that causes a paralysis. Until a recent paper came out, they suggested that it's a volatile ketone, that is a 3-octanone, is the compound that causes the paralysis in nematode. But as you can see in the figure, this is again the nervous system of the nematode that is labeled in green. And these are the response of the nematode in response to the 3 octanone. And this is the response of the nematode in response to pleurotus ostriatus. So you can see that still they were not able to identify the chemical compound that causes the paralysis. And in order to solve this issue, I developed a novel system for collecting the toxin from the droplet itself. And my system includes a strip of filter paper that is attached to a glass tube, which is attached to a metal strand of a micro manipulator. And under a 10 mic of a microscope, I am going to tap individual droplets and collect them and transfer them in nucleus-free water for further analysis. And as you can see, this is a really, really laborious process because you are trying to collect a compound from a structure that is like 2 to 5 micrometer in diameter. And if you are successful in a single day, you might be able to harvest the compound from maybe 300 to 500 droplets in a single day. So like it's like really, really laborious process to collect the droplets. And after collecting the droplets, I'm going to do two major experiments. One is the bioassay. The bioassay means that I'm going to collect the, drop, collect the droplets, suspend them in water, then again adding to the nematode to see if they are able to paralyze the nematode. And the second activity is the LCMS in which I'm going to use it to identify the chemical compounds that are present in this extract. So I, do, I have some preliminary results from the bioassay that I'm going to show you now. So this is the control in which you can see the movement of the nematode in water only. You can see how vigorously nematode is swimming throughout the water. And this is the movement of the nematode in the water that have the suspended compound. You can see the activity of the nematode is changed. Its behavior is modified. Uh, the posterior half of the nematode is kind of paralyzed. So I was a, with my method, I was able to collect this bioactive compound that is further used for LCMS and possibly determining the chemical moiety that causes the paralysis in nematode. So that is the gist of my talk. Coming to summary, the nematophagy have evolved only in pleurotaceae, and within the pleurotaceae, the trapping devices are messaging scavenging mechanisms without any other function, and the nematode trapping as well as trap formation are two separate processes in which they can produce the trap, but they might not be able to trap the nematode. And number of traps cannot be used as a measure of predacity of the fungi, meaning that if a fungi produces more traps, that doesn't necessarily mean that it is more carnivorous compared to other fungi. And the identity of the neurotoxin is questionable, and uh, with the method that I developed and the funding from Mycological Society of Washington, D.C., I am hoping to identify the chemical moiety that causes the paralysis. And the future direction are using transcriptomics to uh, identify the gene expression pattern, as well as the comparative genomics to understand evolution of those genes across a phylogeny to get a holistic view of nematophagy in pleurotaceae. And I also want to say thank you to my lab as well as my College Society of Washington, D.C. for providing the 
financial support and my committee members as well as my friends and all the people who have gathered here to attend my talk. At last, but not the least, when you go out in the field, collect oyster mushrooms, please take a moment to think about the countless number of nematodes that are killed by the fungi to get nitrogen. Thank you. Wow, bravo, that was awesome. I, I love that talk. And I love your slides. The, those cartoons were amazing. And the videos of the nematode, that was like really, really cool. Wow. Um, well, we have a question in the chat. Um, you have also some great talks, um, people who agree with me. So Megan asked, did you introduce the nematodes to your fungal culture plates as eggs or adults? And how did you choose the species to use? So for this, I'm like uh, adding the nematode as uh, adults. So these are like uh, sea elegans uh, that are like bought from a culture center. And like they are like mostly used for like nervous system and we know like neurobiology of the nematode. So if we are able to identify the chemical moiety or the toxin, then we can like have an understanding of the biochemical mechanism that causes the paralysis. I have a related question. So the you you said that Stropharia rugoso and nulata and uh, one of the coprinus species, um, they didn't trap the nematodes, but I was wondering, it, could it be that they trap a different kind? Like it, or that, uh, Mitch was wondering that too. Okay. <laughs> uh, but um, maybe, I don't know. Uh, the paper that they used, they were also using C. elegans. And based on that, also, they were like not able to trap and consume nematode. I'm also wondering that maybe those structures are for not nematode trapping, but maybe for defensive mechanism against fungivorous uh, invertebrates, because there are like other species of invertebrates that are able feed on fungal mycelia. So maybe they are like evolved as a mechanism to defend against fungivorous insects. We can see like similar to plants where they produce the thorns and other stuff to defend themselves with the herbivorous animals. So I am kind of thinking in like that way. And I also want to uh, point out that there was an, another study in Tropheria rugosa annulata where they looked at the developmental processes of acandocytes, and they found that the formation of the acandocytes were like not affected by the nitrogen concentration. So, and uh, if you collect uh, Tropheria rugosa annulata in the wild, you can have like spread like rhizoids that are growing into the substratum and you might be able to find like white powders that are surrounding the rhizoids and those are actually the acanthocytes so the, they are like detachable and one other thing that i want to point out is that the acanthocytes are actually crystals they don't have any fungal tissue so whereas in the case of members of pleurotaceae we can actually stain them with hot and blue and you can have like the adhesive knob of Pohin Buhilia, you can actually, that is like made up of fungal cell wall. Whereas in the case of Tropharia, it's like crystals that are accumulating. So that is my understanding. That's very cool. No, that's, that's very helpful. Thank you. Uh, one more question from Tom and then we will move on to the next talk. I think I have like 50 more questions. So we'll have to bring you back um, after, you know, you go to the next phase of your research. But Tom asks, are all nematophagus fungi saprotrophic? Do they tend to be white rot or brown rot? And are there any lichens that are nematophagus? Uh, based on our understanding, uh, most of the fungi that are able to trap and consume nematodes are like saprotrophic and uh, the pleurotus and huinbuculia, they are white rot and I don't know about like any brown rot species that is able to trap and consume nematodes, but I think it is suggested as a mechanism to supplement nitrogen and I think most of them are white rot fungi. That definitely, that makes sense. Well, very cool. Uh, your research is awesome. And I love the multimedia 
aspect of it. I, it's like funny because you showed so many cool pictures in your language, so beautiful that I totally misunderstood what you meant by cultural studies. And I thought that you were talking about like <laughs> art and I'm like, wow, this is a really different approach. Which <laughs> that's embarrassing. I probably should say that, but anyway. Um, so thank you again, Prasant. That was terrific. And we're very happy to have you.